sermon series is called Momentum. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're making progress in this season. And when God begins to give you that momentum, you can't be stopped. and You will not let anything break it in Jesus' name. Let's go right to the word. Hallelujah. Turn your Bibles with me to Mark chapter 7, chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. And for your hearing, I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. The Gospel of Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. When you have it, say amen. 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 Hallelujah. The Gospel of Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And it reads as follows. And again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Talking about Jesus. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. Verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. This is the word of the Lord. I want to talk for the next few minutes and I need somebody to declare this with me. I need you to look at somebody next to you and say, neighbor, neighbor. Good, morning. good morning. I have a word for you. You are delivered from the stuck place. Oh, I need somebody to give him praise right now. I need somebody to repeat after me. You are delivered from the stuck place. Oh, somebody clap your hands right now if you receive that word. Let's pray right where we are. Father, we give you glory. We give you honor and praise. We thank you for the word that is set before us. We thank you, Lord, that you are faithful and you are awesome. Lord, we need to hear from you. We need a word from you. And we ask right now that you would have your way in Jesus' name. We thank you in advance for the power that's going to come with this word. And we thank you for what you have planned. We even ask that you would use me. Hide me behind your cross. And we ask that you would speak boldly, Lord God, that your word will come forth with boldness and clarity. Fresh anointing fall fresh in the name of Jesus. That somebody may be healed, set free, delivered, and even saved in Jesus' name. So we ask that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear hearts to receive like never before, and we give you all the glory and all the praise. We thank you in advance that the devil is defeated. He has no power. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So we thank you, Lord God, in advance for instructing us, convicting us, moving us, teaching us, pushing us, encouraging us, lifting us up, that we would look just like you, and you would be glorified in our life. So we honor you, we adore you, we love you, and we ask right now that you speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. We give you all the glory, we give you all the praise. We ask it all in Jesus' name. People of God, shout it, amen. amen. You are delivered from the stuck place. All right. That's the word. All right. My brothers and my sisters, I came here today to declare to you that I have had enough. All right, come on now. Come on. And the enemy declared it, and the enemy confirmed it at praise and worship. Yes. I have had enough. You know what I've had enough of? I'm tired of this. You know what I'm tired of? I'm tired of serving and seeing 
and being with a God who has set us free only to see us walk in bondage. I've had enough. I've had enough of knowing a God that's able to do anything but fail, able to heal any issue, no matter how hard, no matter how big or how small, but yet we continue to stay in sickness. I've had enough. We serve a God that's able to give us joy unspeakable, but yet we walk around discouraged and depressed and worried. Hallelujah. What do you do when we know that the God that we praise every Sunday when we come together, the God that's with us, that's waking us up every morning, is giving us the peace that surpasses all understanding, but yet we're still walking in anxiety. Something's not right when we have a shout and we have a praise, but we go home the same way. Something's not right when we're moving and we believe God and we're trusting God, but yet it seems like things are just the same and things are the same. Has anybody ever been to that point where you thought things should be different by now? You shouldn't be thinking about that X by now. You shouldn't still have that sickness in your body by now. But yet and still, it seems like no matter how much takes place and how much time goes by, things remain the same. Isn't it tough for the seasons to change, but the pain remain the same? If you're like me, you've had enough. And if there's somebody here that says, I'm tired of living like that. I'm tired of accepting defeat if God has promised me victory. I'm tired of having this strife in marriage if God has ordained us to live happily ever after. Is there somebody here that says, I have had enough? Well, listen, truth be told, there's somebody here that you will admit that even through your smile and even through your well wishes, you can admit today that you are stuck. Somebody is stuck in the shame of their past. Somebody else is stuck in that discouragement thinking that things will never come around. Do I, am I talking to the right church? Hallelujah. There's some people who've come out of this place and you're no longer stuck, but there's somebody here that's still stuck. And God has given me assignment, whether you're online or whether you're in the congregation, to speak to the stuck place. Because the Lord that we serve has declared it is time for you to come out of the stuck place. Somebody say amen. Oh, I'm excited about this word. See, he, why? Somebody says, Pastor, I don't understand. It seems like I've been in this place forever, and I can't, I'm asked the ministers to come and pray for me, but yet I'm still stuck. Why am I stuck? And I got two reasons why you might be stuck, and we're going to get to the word, and then we're going to all get free in Jesus' name. Watch this. The first reason why you might find yourself stuck, and please write this down, take your pen and pad. I believe it's going to speak to somebody. The reason why you find yourself stuck is you have given a temporary trial a permanent place. You have given a temporary trial a permanent place. There are some things that you went through and there were some things, I'm talking to somebody specific, there were some things, the things that have happened to you that was beyond your control. And God allowed those things to happen to you so he can come and move in your life and bless you in spite of what you've been through. But yet, we've taken something temporary and we've made it permanent. Whenever, somebody listen to me, Whenever you are going through a trial, whenever you've experienced that tough situation, 
Whenever you've been abused, whenever you've been lied on, whenever you've been walked out on, the enemy tries to tell you that it was your fault and this is what your life is going to be. And all of a sudden, a valley shifts from a pass-through place to a dwelling place. And now five years have passed, and we are living in something we were supposed to go through. Am I talking to somebody here? This is very important that the enemy does not deceive you into believing that this is how it's going to be. You can tell, oh, somebody hear me. You can tell when a man or woman of God has accepted the place that they are because when they want to ease their pain, they choose their medication rather than God's demonstration. Do you know what I'm talking about? When I say your medication, I'm not talking about Advil. When I say your medication, I'm not talking about Tylenol. When I say your medication, I'm talking about that thing that you use to medicate the pain and not take the pain completely away. When I'm talking about medication, that's when you come to the conclusion, oh well, I guess I just got to carry this, but if I take a little sip of something, it's going to make me feel better and I can at least sleep good. If I can just get with this and do this activity, it's going to take the edge off and it's going to make me forget about it. I hate when I think about it and I get so depressed that I have to deal with it. I'd rather have medication than demonstration. Somebody say amen. amen. But somebody has come to know, and I believe at least three or four people have a testimony that the day that you decided to put your medicine in the cabinet and get on your knees and cry out to God, you realize the thing that you had to carry for seven years was something that was able to be released to God. And when God gets a hold of it, all of a sudden, we don't have to be bound anymore. We don't have to be broken anymore. We don't have to be in chains anymore. Because the sun sets free is free indeed. And we have to make sure that we are not putting a permanent place to a temporary trial. Am I talking to somebody here? That thing that you're supposed to go to, it was not supposed to define you. It was not supposed to be your identity. It was supposed to be something that God takes authority over. Are you hearing what I'm saying? What is that thing in your life that you have mislabeled permanent? What are those things in your life that's mislabeled permanent? There are some people that God is ready for you to grow so you can walk in your marriage. But the reason why you are still single is because your self-esteem tells you that you don't deserve a good man. Let me talk over here. They're looking at me kind of crazy. See, you are, sometimes we are in the place that we're at is because we feel that this is all it's going to be because I've been there so long. Wow. And I would hate for somebody to have such a condition for a long time that you get comfortable in it. Wow. Or somebody hearing what I'm saying. Amen. And God is saying, listen, you don't have to be comfortable in that condition because that trial, that storm has a temporary plan and a temporary purpose and it is going to be used to bless your life like never before. So stop accepting the defeat of the situation. Stop accepting that you feel somehow you deserve this. Stop accepting what's taking place because this is the time that the shift is going to happen in your life. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. You have given a temporary trial to a permanent place. Amen. Here's another, another reason why you may be stuck. And please write this down. Hallelujah. Ooh, this is going to mess somebody up. The second reason why you may be stuck. Woo! Get this. You have allowed your giftedness to distract you from your brokenness. Woo! You have allowed your giftedness.
giftedness to distract you from your brokenness. What are you talking about? See, you've got to be careful. Sometimes, watch this, God blesses up us with amazing gifts. And God has given us amazing things that we have. And sometimes, watch this, when we operate in our gift, all of a sudden, great results happen. Sometimes we get promotions on the job as a result of operating in our gifts. Sometimes we end up making more money in terms of operating in our gifts. Sometimes we can even be used of God in church when we operate in our gifts. But just because we are operating in our gifts doesn't always mean that we're whole. Oh, y'all hearing what I'm saying? I want you to get this because many people want God to bless what they do and to increase what they do. And sometimes if we have a form of success, it could distract us from dealing with our stuff. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? I'm going to keep saying it until you get it because this is very important because the modern day body of Christ is gifted. The modern day body of Christ can do a lot of things well. And sometimes if we look good and we can shine on the platform, we give an illusion that we got it all together because we can sing. We give an illusion because we can preach we got it all together. We get an illusion because we serve in a great way. Or even we do our job well. But God says, be careful. Don't let your giftedness keep you from dealing with brokenness. Because what ends up taking place, if you are only concerned about your blessing and your talent, you will have a great talent but bad character. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And there are many people who think just because they got it going on at work that they're whole and they're healthy. I'm trying to help somebody here. How many know your title can't make you healthy? Uh, see, your place in ministry isn't the thing that makes you whole. I know you can do and you can operate and you can handle business, but when you go before God, He's going to ask you, what does your heart look like? And there's too many people who are going down in scandal because their talent could take them where their character couldn't keep them. I need somebody to hear this. When you are walking with God, it is important not just for God to push you forward and to use you because true momentum is not just about God using your gifts. True momentum is about God shaping your heart. True momentum is not just walking and doing and performing, but true momentum comes in your prayer life. When you say, Lord, show me what's inside of my heart. And anything that is of you, I, I need you to pour it out. Anything that is not of you, I need you to take it away in the name of Jesus. Because I don't just want to be gifted. I want to be healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You've seen this. Many praise and worship leaders, many musicians come under churches that all they care about is how well you play and how well you sing. And as long as you're in place at 10 o'clock, that's all we need. As long as you can hit that run and make everybody stand up. But at Freedom Movement Church, we want to know how is your heart going? How are you doing? How can I pray for you? Because the people you need to pray for are the gifted people. Because gifted people got a target on their back. Gifted people got demons running after them. Gifted people are the ones that God wants to use, but the enemy wants to kill. And we've got to make sure that we don't end up being in a stuck place and never deal with it because we got money. We never deal with it because we got status. We never deal with it because we feel we got it going on. But at the end of the day, only what you do for Christ will last. And the question becomes, what does your heart look like? Are you 
you seeing this? So I want to make sure that you're not just stuck because you endured storms and you thought that things were permanent. It's only temporary. But I don't want you also to get stuck in the illusion of giftedness and the illusion of forward movement if we're never dealing with our hearts. I need somebody to say amen. amen. Oh, I'm speaking today. Wherever you are, if you are in a stuck place, it's time for you to come out. Yep. You know what I come to realize? Stuck place isn't always across the board. Isn't that right? Sometimes you can be free in one place and stuck in another place. And sometimes we can be free in one area and be operating in that and be in denial about this other thing we don't want you to see. Yeah. I'm going to talk by myself. That's all right. That's all right. But what God has given me assignment to do today is speak to your stuck place. Yeah. You know what he wants me to say? You are hereby delivered from your stuck place. Amen. Come on, clap your hands and give him glory. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to give you the keys to victory. For your stuck place today. I got a long way to go and a short time to get there. Amen. amen. This text had so much stuff in it. I could have had about 12 or 15 points. <laughs> we could have preached about 4 o'clock or 4.30. Amen. <laughs> Can we do that? <laughs> oh, thank you. Bless your heart. Bless your heart. <laughs> this is music to my ears. When I hear my sisters, take your time, Pastor. <laughs> Man, I'm going to preach another 45 minutes now just because of that. I love y'all. Y'all all right. Listen, so there are some keys here to your, anybody ready to be free of this? Oh, God, I'm, I'm believing God to move. Watch this. So we see in this text, Jesus was in a place called Capernaum. And if you look at the Gospels of Mark, Mark is called an action gospel. You don't hear about the genealogies. You don't hear about the, the stories of the birth of Jesus in elaborate fashion. Mark gets right to the ministry. He gets right to the point. He gets baptized. He goes right to the, the wilderness to be tempted. And all of a sudden, his ministry is started. Hallelujah. And you see the word immediately used about 45 to 50 times in the gospel of Mark because it's an action gospel. But the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry takes place in a place called Capernaum. Uh, Capernaum was about at the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and in that city, this is where Jesus chose to do his ministry. And the tragic thing about Capernaum is out of all the miracles that were done in Capernaum, the city refused to repent. Can you imagine Jesus physically being in your city? preaching signs and wonders and people see him in the flesh but still hold on to their stuff. And because of that, Capernaum goes down in history not as a city that thrived but a city that was ultimately condemned because they never gave their heart to the Lord. Are you saying this? Hallelujah. And can I tell you something? Whenever the word comes to your city, there's always a responsibility of repentance. Amen. Because you can't hear the word and stay the same. Amen. Oh, somebody say amen. amen. But I want to get to this text because I believe that there is a word for you, my brother and my sister, because it's time for you to get unstuck. Amen? amen. And it's right here in this text. I believe, and I got five keys. I told you there was a lot. We're going to get right through them, and then we're going to go home. Watch this. Let's look at Mark chapter 2, verse 1. The Bible says, and again, he entered Capernaum after some days. And it was heard that Jesus was in the house. Now, what house is this? The house that Jesus was in was Peter and Andrew's house. Because Jesus never put money down on the property, you understand me. He never, you know, had his earnest money. He didn't, he didn't go through all that. He, he didn't show up at departments. Not the apartments, but departments. He didn't show up at departments to give his rent. 
because he never had his own place. Jesus' name was never on the title. You feel me? <laughs> so whenever he would be at a place, he would stay with somebody. And wasn't it awesome that Peter and Andrew thought it enough to open up their home and welcome Jesus in? So we see at the outset of this text is that Jesus was in the house. And he was in the house because Peter and Andrew opened up their house. Are you seeing this? Point number one, your key to being unstuck is this. Write it down. The blessing on your life is connected to Jesus being welcomed in your house. The blessing on your life is connected to Jesus being welcomed in your house. This is important. It might seem simple on the outside, but sometimes it's easier said than done. See, we already know without a shadow of a doubt that we are welcome in God's house. Yes, we enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter into his courts with praise. Yes, this is the Lord's house. Yes, this is Jesus' house. And it's obvious that the man of God, the woman of God, the unbeliever, the adulterer, the gay, uh, homosexual, the person that's operating in fornication are all welcome at his house. Amen. Amen. That's a shout for somebody here. Yeah. Because no matter how you've fallen short, no matter how you've missed the mark, isn't it great to know if you knock on Jesus' door, he's going to always let you in. So, he is welcome. You are always welcome at his house. But my question to you is, is he welcome in your house? Is he welcome in your house? See, I grew up, Teresa, seeing a whole lot of things with church folk. I was a child, and I used to be in church, and I would see people running up and down the aisles and shouting on cue, and they could dance. And I'm wondering, where did you learn to dance like that? You must be in the mirror practice. You got to do some practice to get it like that. And as soon as the Holy Ghost fall, they make their way right to the front of the church. So everybody can bend a little bit. And I see this. And I used to say, wow, that's awesome. And please be clear that some people that's dancing, their praise is sincere. And I can't say you're doing too much because I don't know what you've been through. Because if you've come out and God has blessed you, you want to dance, go right ahead. I ain't got a problem with it. But the issue that I have is when I would see the dance, but then I see you cursing out your husband on the way to the car. I've seen people, I'm told you, good number. oh, praise the Lord, how you doing, Sister Johnson? It's good to see you, blessed and highly favored. <laughs> and it leads me to believe that there is a disconnect. Because if you can shout in God's house, but curse on your way to your house, my question becomes, is God welcome in your house? And we must be careful, oh, it's going to mess somebody up, that we do not compartmentalize Jesus. What do you mean by that? You know what compartmentalize means? Compartmentalize means that we have compartments in our life. And we can have a Sunday compartment. That when it's Sunday at 11 o'clock, I'm going to turn on my gospel music. Somebody mad at me today. Is that y'all? Somebody was on the sound booth. One of y'all's in the sound booth trying to mess the sound up. Y'all was mad at me today. We can compartmentalize because sometimes on when it's time, we open up our Bibles because we're in church. We compartmentalize because we can sing the blessings of God. But what do we do when we can do that on Sunday? But on Monday is, hold up, hold up, hold up. Ha, 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 ha. Yeah. 
Folks don't even rap no more. It's just whoop, ha, whoop. That's all it is. But what ends up happening, I want you to pray for y'all, Pastor. I need Jesus. Listen, you've got to be careful that you don't create disconnects. Because when disconnects happen, the only time in your compartmentalized life that you read the word is when the pastor's preaching. Or the only time you say hallelujah is when Amber's leading worship. But God says, when you let Jesus into your house, you don't have to get primed to praise. I don't have to tell you to lift up your hands because you came in with your hands lifted up because you had a worship experience at the house. You don't have to see how am I going to pray. You've already been praying all week. So when you come in here, it's an extension of what's already taking place. Hallelujah. You are preaching and speaking a word of God. I know you're receiving the word, but you are speaking the word in your house because you understand that this is what my lifestyle is. This is how I move. This is how I live. And if I'm not going to be stuck, I can't put Jesus in a comfortable box and pull him out when it's convenient for me. I've got to lift Jesus up no matter what's taking place. I got to praise at the church, but I got to praise at my house. I got to praise at the church, but I got to praise on my job. I got to praise at the church, but I got to praise in my car. And it only becomes, it goes from being an occurrence to being a lifestyle. And what you end up seeing is that you have momentum in your life because Jesus is not just at your church, but he's also at your house. Somebody say amen. Sometimes it's hard inviting Jesus in because it forces us to clean up. Am I talking to somebody? I'm being led to the Lord here. Sometimes when we let Jesus in our house, it forces us to clean up. And sometimes it forces us to deal with stuff that we had swept away in the closet and forgot about. Come on, come on, Pastor. Oh, I'm believing something's going to break today. Yes, sir. But the blessing comes when you watch this, you welcome Jesus into your house. Because the outset of this miracle would not take place if Peter and Andrew didn't walk in generosity and open up their home for Jesus. Your life will change when you open up your home. Did you hear what I said? Your situation will come around when you begin to open up your home to Jesus. They heard he was in the house. Watch this verse 2. Immediately many gathered together. So there was no longer room to receive them. Not even near the door. And watch this verse 2. And Jesus preached the word to them. You see this? Jesus Preach the word to them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, here's what you've got to understand. This is a very important part of the miracle, Jesse. And we will gloss over this point and grow down to verse 11 where Jesus says, pick up your mat and walk. Yeah. And we'll look and say, man, he was paralyzed. And now Jesus just spoke to him and said, pick up your mat and walk. But the thing that set up the miracle was the word. Are you seeing it? The thing that set the miracle up was the word. And this is very important. See, many of us are looking for a miracle. Let's be honest. By show of hands, somebody in here needs a miracle. Raise your hand. It's all right. My hand is up too. I do need a miracle. But God told me in my study and he knocked me over and said, bro, you need a miracle, but I already gave you a miracle. I said, Lord, what are you talking about? What miracle you gave me? I'm still, the situation is still off. What miracle have you given me? It's still broken. What miracle have you given me? And he says, the miracle that I gave you was the word that I spoke to you. And I need somebody to understand that when God has promised your miracle, a lot of times you already have it while you're still looking for it. And the reason why you already have it, because the merit 
spiritual before it becomes manifestation is first revelation. Oh, Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. See, here's what you've got to understand. Point number two, I need you to write this down. Never underestimate the miracle of God's message. Never underestimate the miracle of God's message. Oh, y'all going to get this in a second. He said, and he preached the word to them. See, it's one thing. Can somebody just attest to this? It's one thing for you to hear a good word and you to say hallelujah. Ooh, that was a good word. But it's another thing for you to get the word in your spirit. It's one thing for you to hear something that made your emotions happy. But it's another thing to catch something in your spirit to the point that not only did it bless you on Sunday, but it also blessed you on Tuesday. See, here is the thing. People of God, you've got to realize every time you open up your Bible, you are witnessing a miracle. Oh, y'all gonna miss it. Give me a second. Every time you open up your word, there is a miracle right in front of you. Because the thing about the word is when you get the word in your spirit, God doesn't have to speak to your situation. Because we as the people of God who have the spirit of God, when we speak the word to the situation, the situation has to do exactly what God's word says. Because God's word is the final authority. Y'all got it twisted. Y'all thought the Bible was a history book. This thing ain't no history book where you learn Genesis and Adam and Eve. Yes, those things happen historically, but it's an organic move of God every time you open up the Bible and you can read, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But five years later, when you needed something and everybody walked out on you and all of a sudden God showed up in your life and you realized that he was your shepherd, you realized that he took care of you. When you open up the Bible, it takes on a new meaning because now you see a different revelation because you know what it's like to be provided for. Am I talking to somebody here? The miracle you need is right in the word of God because here's what I've come to understand. The devil doesn't care if you shout. The devil is entertained by good church. The devil doesn't care if you shout, but the devil does care if you study. The devil doesn't care if you shout, but when you start studying, ooh, when you start committing it to your memory, when the word starts becoming your mindset, you begin to speak those things that are not as though they were. You begin to prophesy to dry bones and prophesy to dead places. You begin to speak the word over barren place and all of a sudden things will begin to sprout up. You begin to speak to sickness, the word of God and you'll say, he was bruised for our transgression, wound for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him but by his stripes we are healed and you begin to notice that there's healing that takes place in your body because you speak what the word has said about your healing and the word gets in your spirit and you no longer care about what it looks like or what it feels like because as long as the word says it, that's what you're saying though. Amen. Are you saying this? And this is important that we have a discipline of study because my prayer when I preach or my prayer when I hear somebody else preach, I don't just want to be taught. I want it to be caught. I don't want to just hear a word and say, that's what's up. But I want to have a word that is in my belly that the spirit of God can pull back up. It's important. Whenever the word hits your spirit, it's a miracle. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. We got to continue to move. Watch this. Oh, I like this part. Look at verse 3. We talk about getting unstuck. Look at verse 3. 
they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. Hallelujah. So in other words, we see the word was going forth. And we see there was a man that needed to get to Jesus. But the only problem was he couldn't get there by himself. And the reason why he couldn't get there by himself is because he didn't have momentum. He didn't have movement in his body. and He was not physically able to get into the presence of Jesus. But he had the right friends. And he had some friends that understood what it was like to be paralyzed. Because if I am going to lift up a grown man with my boys and not stop until I get into the presence of God, something's happened along the way that has let me know that Jesus is able to heal any kind of paralyzed situation. There were four friends that along their faith journey, something must have happened in their life that made them say, if you could do it for me, I know you can do it for him. There's something that they believe in terms of being in the presence of God that's, listen, this is not just somebody that's talking good. There is transforming power in the presence of God. And I have an urgency to where if I see somebody paralyzed, I realize that you ain't got to be paralyzed any longer because the power of God is able to take you out of your paralyzed situation. Oh, I feel like preaching this. Are you seeing this? So what happened is anybody who comes to the knowledge of the power of God was somebody that needed the power of God. You didn't come to the knowledge of it until you seen it demonstrated in your own life. Are you saying this? Anybody ever been delivered and healed or something? Raise your hand. Here's your assignment. If you have ever been healed and delivered, your hands have an assignment. If you've ever been set free, your hands have an assignment. And your hands have an assignment of picking somebody up who can't walk. Because you used to be that one that can't walk. And there was somebody there that was able to pray for you and bring you into the presence of God. And now that you have your sight, now that you have your healing, now that you can run in Jesus' name, you have a responsibility of reaching back and getting somebody and bringing them to the altar. You have a responsibility of saying, you don't have to live like this. I hate it when the people of God tolerate somebody's paralyzed situation. Are you hearing me? As if God can't fix it. But you need to get around some folk and say, you know what? I know a man that's able to do exceedingly abundantly what we're able to hope for, ask for. I know a man who died for my sins and made me whole. Point number three, I need you to write this down. You have an assignment with your hands. But write this down. Point number three of being unstuck. The people of God, watch this, have a calling and a responsibility to stay free. Amen. I'm going to say it again. The people of God have a calling and a responsibility to stay free. You notice I didn't say the people of God have a responsibility to get free. It says people have a responsibility to stay free. What's the difference? See, there are a lot of people who are stuck, but they've gotten free before. But now they're still stuck. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? There are a lot of people who, yes, they've witnessed the power of God, but yet they found themselves in the same thing that they just got out of. But it is very important because you're wondering what is your call? What is your purpose? You are called to consistent freedom. And it's very critical that when you get free, you have a calling and responsibility 
to stay free. Amen. Why do you have a responsibility to stay free? Because I can't lift you to the Lord if I'm stuck in the cycle. I can't lift you consistently if I'm in my stuff every five minutes. I've got to get to a point, watch this, that if God has blessed me with the mercy of saving my life, I've got a calling to show somebody else the light of the Lord. Are y'all here? So we have to understand that our hands must stay free because truth be told, You've got to please God with your life and with your righteousness, but you've also got to help somebody else with your righteousness. Are you seeing what I'm saying? What would have happened if their friends weren't available? He would be in his house paralyzed, not able to move. But because he had the right people around him, he ended up being at the house where Jesus was speaking and Jesus was moving. And it was the sacrifice of four men that was willing to carry their friend to Jesus. Are you seeing what I'm saying? Here's what you've got to understand. The calling of God is not a calling to be cute. The calling of God calls us to bear somebody else's burdens. The calling of God have calls for us to stand in the gap because there are some people around us that can't pray and they don't pray for themselves and they don't know how. But here you are and here you come. You've got a prayer life. You know what it's like to call in the name of the Lord. You've seen God get you out of your paralyzed situation. And I would hate for us to miss out on an opportunity to carry somebody to Jesus because I would hate for somebody to die in paralysis. Yeah. Oh, am I helping somebody here? Yeah. The people of God have a calling and responsibility to stay free. This is why the word says, since we are, are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, all the people who have gone before us will walk in faith. Hebrews 12, 1 says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us, that so easily entangles us, that we can run the race looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Are you seeing this? And you never know. Your sacrifice could be the difference in somebody else's transformation. You saying no to foolishness could lead to somebody else saying yes to Jesus. You saying no to your past stuff could be the difference between somebody giving their life to Jesus Christ. And you've got to ask yourself, how are you going to posture yourself? Because the key to being unstuck is to make sure that you stay free. How do we get stuck again? Because sometimes we're like the ten lepers. When they had leprosy and they was jacked up and they saw Jesus and said, Father, have mercy on me. And Jesus said, go ahead, show yourselves to the priests. And the Bible says, as they went, they were cleansed. As they did what God said do, they were cleansed. But the Bible also says, only one of them came back and got on their knees and said, wait a minute, look at my hands. Look at, look at my body. The leprosies lead me. Who is so merciful and gracious to heal my body? I've got to go back and say thank you. And of 10 people who got healed, only one came back to worship. And the problem comes, I want you to hear me, is when we get stuck, is that we want God's hand, but we don't want his face. We get stuck when we cry out because we're hurting, but all we wanted was the healing, but we didn't want the relationship. But if there's somebody here that realizes that you know what? I don't want you to just do something. I want you to be my Lord. I don't want you to just show up and work it out for me. Lord, I want to walk with you. I want to follow you. I want to do what your word says because I can't believe that now I can walk again because I was dying on the inside. I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe. But all of a sudden, you came and you thought enough of me to fix me. 
I think enough that you will worship you. Somebody say amen. amen. Oh, God, the people have a calling and responsibility to stay free. And the way you stay free is when God moves in your life, it moves you to a place of gratitude and humility, and now you dedicate your heart to him. Because if you only get well, but don't give your heart to him, you'll get sick again. We got to keep going. Are y'all being blessed by this? Point number one. What's point number one? Somebody was taking notes. Praise the Lord for you. The blessing on your life is connected to Jesus being welcome in your house. Point number two. Never underestimate the miracle of God's message. Point number three. The people of God have a calling and responsibility to stay free. Well, look at point number four, y'all. Y'all got to see this. Look at this. Look at this. Watch this. Y'all pray for me. When they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. Oh, what does your word say, Jesse? Because they couldn't come near him because of the crowd, they just gave up and went back home. That's not, that's not what your word said. Trace, what's your word say? Because they tried to come near him, but because of the crowd, they figured that they couldn't get to Jesus like they thought they could. The Bible says, when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken through, oh, I feel like shouting, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. I want you to see this. It preaches itself. When they could not go near him because of the crowd, guess what they did? They kept going. There was no real logical way to go, but they kept going. Why did they keep going? Because there was something inside of them that says, if Jesus is in the vicinity, there's nothing that can keep you away from his presence. If Jesus is around, He's always available. And what the enemy wants to do, he wants to deceive you by the crowds. Because sometimes when you are looking for a move of God, sometimes it seems like it's hard to get to Jesus. And there is a crowd there. There is a crowd of disappointment. There is a crowd of past issues. There is a crowd of low elf expectation. There is a crowd of low faith. But we've got to get to a point in our life that our belief system says, if Jesus is there, no matter how many times I have to call him, no matter how late I got to stay up praying, no matter how many days I got to turn down my plate, when I seek him, I will find him when I seek him with all my heart. I understand that the God that I serve, no matter what I need, when I need it, even if he doesn't answer immediately, doesn't mean he doesn't hear me because he is a good, good father. Stop believing that God didn't hear your prayer. Many of us are stuck because we have a mindset that thinks that we can't get a prayer through and God ain't got time for us. Ooh, the man upstairs, if you got time to deal with me, you might be blessing somebody. The devil is a liar. He's omnipotent. He's everywhere. He's all powerful. He's omnipresent. But not only does he have omnipresence, but he also has manifest presence. Omnipresence means that, yes, he's seeing everything, but manifest presence happens when you call on his name and his presence be made manifest in your life. And all of a sudden, you see the healing. All of a sudden, you get the joy. All of a sudden, you get the peace. All of a sudden, you get the answer. All of a sudden, you get the breakthrough. And we've got to get to a place in understanding that if God is present, I'm going to get to him by any means necessary. Is there somebody here that has a by any means necessary faith? I've been praying, so I'm going to start praising. I've been praising, so I'm going to start fasting. I've been fasting, I'm going to start worshiping. And I'm going to continue to call on the name of the Lord until he hears my cry. I'm going to continue to call on the name of the Lord until he gives me the deliverance. I'm going to continue to call upon the name of the Lord until the situation turns around. Because I understand we 
serve a God that hears the cry of his people. This is important because there are many people who are deceived and they believe God doesn't hear me. I hear it all the time, Pastor, can you pray for me? Because God don't hear me. And I say, bro, I'll gladly pray for you. But I need you to go home and pray for yourself. I need you to stop giving up at the sign of the crowd. I need you to stop giving up at the sound of difficulty. Is somebody getting this, this, getting this right here? Sometimes God doesn't immediately respond. You know what Jesus could have done? Jesus could have been preaching. And could have said, Ooh. he could have, he said, oh, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. There's somebody in his paralyzed. Make way, make room, make way. Because I promised you, Jesus knew the paralyzed man was there before the paralyzed man knew Jesus. Y'all yeah. missed this. Yeah. This is a little unorthodox today, but we're going to get it. Watch this. Jesus knew of his presence before the paralyzed man knew of his presence. He could have easily said, you know what? Open up the way. Y'all carry the seat. These four men carry him through. But Jesus just kept preaching. He knew they were there, but he just kept preaching. Jesus said, you know what? I could make it easy and park the ways for you to come. But I see I've deposited faith in you that I need you to exercise. Sometimes he doesn't make the way easy, but he makes your faith great. Sometimes he doesn't make it cookie cutter and you can just open the door but sometimes it gives you a prayer life and says I'm going to need you to tarry now. I'm going to need you to press in now. I'm going to need you to keep going now. I'm going to need you to be creative now because he knew that paralyzed man was going to get to me because there was some folk that had a by any means necessary mentality. They must have looked crazy. Can you imagine he ain't seen Jesus preach and you see the roof open up. <laughs> Disciples like, bro, Jesus, Jesus. They try to break in the house. Call 911. Now, Peter, let me get my peace. What's going on? Who is that? <laughs> but Jesus kept preaching. And he kept preaching. And all of a sudden, while the word was going forth, there was a move of God taking place. Because it's one thing to see faith being talked about, but it's another thing to see faith in action. It's one thing to see what we talk about, what the word says, but it's another thing to see the word of God in action. And all of a sudden, we saw the man being lifted down from the roof because the, 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 the people that carried him would not take no for an answer. Point number four, write this down. Your destiny will be fulfilled when you walk in desperate faith. Oh, Come on. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Do y'all hear this? Your destiny will be fulfilled when you walk in desperate faith. Hallelujah. I used to wonder, I used to see overseas in Africa, there would be revivals, and I would see people have broken bones be put back together. I would see these revivals in 2021 where there'd be resurrection, people getting raised from the dead, all kinds of radical things, miracle signs and wonders happening. I'm like, how come that doesn't happen in Marietta? How come that don't happen in downtown Atlanta? And you know what he says? He says, in Africa, they don't have the distraction of iPhones. They don't have the distractions of, of the Wi-Fi not working and being spotty. You know what they have? All they have, sometimes they don't have a lot of material things. But they got something that's immaterial. And you know what it's called? It's called desperate faith. Because you know what? Sometimes they might be in an oppressed country and all they, they need God to make, they might be in a place 
where it's illegal to go to church. They might be in a place that they'll get persecuted for their faith. But you know what it does? It makes them more desperate. And they get to a point and says, you know what? I can't stop until I get to Jesus. And I'm not tripping about money and dollar dollar bills. I'm thinking about this deliverance and this healing and this anointing and this freedom. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And we've got to get to a point that we are not so distracted that we believe God for greater and our faith gets desperate. Are you saying this? Because somebody's turnaround is connected to your desperation. Are you saying it? Hallelujah. Anybody ever been to the place that you're at the altar and you said, if you don't move now, I don't know what I'm able to do. You ever been to the place where you say, I'm lost without you. I can't make it without you. I'm desperate for you. And this is what they said. And they uncovered and they broke through and they let down the bed where she was lying. Your, your destiny will be fulfilled when you walk in desperate faith. Are you hearing me? God says, I have a move, but your faith ain't desperate enough. I would hate for us to have casual faith. And when God does it, we don't see it. We say, oh, well, let me go turn up. I would hate for us to have casual faith. See, I told you he wasn't going to do it. I would hate for us to have casual faith. Oh, well, I guess it wasn't for me. I guess it wasn't meant. But there's somebody that I need to have a desperate faith for your spouse. That you see things might not always be right. But you pray for him and pray for her day and night. I need somebody to have desperate faith for your son and for your daughter. They might be out there with the wrong crowd now. But your desperate cry of faith will let God know that you believe him by faith to change your heart. So I don't know what it is, but if you got desperate faith, that co-worker that be cussing up a storm and doing anything will come to you and say, what must I do to be saved? I think we give up too easy and we don't let God be. I think we throw in the towel too easy and we've got to get to the point where we're going to keep going until the change comes and we're going to keep going until we hear God for ourselves. Are you seeing this? You are delivered from the stuck place. I got one more thing. We're going home right now. Watch this. They've broken through and they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. Look at verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith. Woo, he didn't say when he saw the men. He said when he saw their faith. He said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. Wait a minute. Jesse, I thought he was paralyzed. I thought he couldn't move his body. Jesus, he can't move his arm. Why are you not speaking to his arm? Why are you not speaking to his legs, telling him to get up? And Jesus says, I am speaking to his legs. I am speaking to his body. But before I can speak to his body, I got to speak to his heart. Because the thing that's shutting down the body is not his legs, it's his heart. The thing that's keeping him from walking is not his ability to move, but his ability to repent. See, you got to understand when Jesus sees you and he goes before you, he doesn't deal with you at the surface. He deals with you at the root. Yeah. Aren't you amazed? He says, my son, he didn't say get up and walk, you good. He says, your sins are forgiven. Woo. Can y'all hear this? What? If the reason we are paralyzed is because of something that's going on on the inside and not the outside. Yes, yes. What if the reason why we can't move is not a function of our natural body, but a function of our spiritual body? What if the thing that keeps us bound is not a physical deliverance? But it's a spiritual deliverance. And Jesus says this to tell somebody, point number five, your recovery is connected to your repentance. Your recovery is connected to your repentance. God says you are going to come out of it, but before you move in your body, I've got to move in your soul. 
Before you move in your body, I've got to move in that place. And you have to understand that when we decide that we want to be unstuck, we've got to be open in our heart to ask God for forgiveness of our sins. Amen. Are you saying this? Because your recovery is connected to your repentance. And truth be told, I'm glad that when I go to God, he lets me know what's really going on. I never forget. I had something called a pinched nerve. Anybody had a pinched nerve? The devil is a liar, I promise you. I had this pinched nerve and it was right here, right? It was right here at this part of my thigh. And the thing be tingling and all kind of carrying on, sharp pain. I'm walking around. I got to walk around a dealership all day with a tingly thigh, just mad. Oh, this is some foolishness. And I kept asking God to heal my thigh. But they told me, you got this pain. You need to go see a chiropractor. Okay, chiropractors deal with thighs? I thought chiropractors was, had something to do with a back or something. What my back have to do with my thigh? But when I got to the doctor, I said, Lord, I'm having this pain here. And, the, the, and he felt somewhere back here. And he says, that pain that's here is actually connected to something here. And it was somewhere close to my vertebrae, my spine, that foundation. And if I would have never went to the doctor, I had been seeking the wrong advice and asking for some kind of medication. And I was treating things on my thigh, but the truth and the thing that was wrong was in my foundation. And it took the right doctor to diagnose the real problem. Because I would keep going from store to store, getting ointments and getting bandages for here, but I would still be hurting. But as soon as I met the doctor, the doctor says, it's not right here, it's right here. Oh, and sometimes you won't see the true solution to your issue until you see the doctor. And sometimes this is hurting over here, but the true issue is right here. And this is messed up right here, but the true issue is right here. And when you go see the doctor, he prescribes you some kind of medicine, and it's called goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. He subscribes you a kind of medicine that says the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When my enemies drum and came against me, they stumbled and fell. The war rise against me. In this will I be confident. One thing that I've desired of the Lord, and I will seek after to dwell in his house of the Lord forever. He has a way of prescribing you some medicine. And the medicine says all things work together for good for them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Hallelujah. He surprised the medicine. He says, if you forgive their sins, I will forgive your sins. He prescribes some medicine, and he says, no weapon that be formed against you shall be able to prosper, and every tongue that rises up against you shall be condemned. I dare somebody to go see the doctor, because you realize the doctor never lost the patient. He never lost the case. He never lost any kind of war, and he always knows what prescribed. He knows what you need even before you ask it. That's why he says, seek first the kingdom and all its righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Have you seen the doctor? When you come out of the doctor's office, you'll look different than when you came in. When you come out of the doctor's office, you'll be free indeed. When you come out of the doctor's office, you might have had pain before. Now you got to praise now. When you come out of the doctor's office, you got a testimony that says, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I don't know where he would be. When I get out of the doctor's office, I'm new again. I'm whole again. I can pick up my bed and walk again. I 
can smile again. I can have peace again. I can have victory again. I can walk in authority again because I've seen the doctor and my recovery was connected to my repentance. Is there somebody here that knows the doctor? There was a doctor and he had something in his hand and he was carrying that old rugged cross. There was the doctor that he was beaten and he was bruised and he took a whole bunch of beating. They cursed at him. They spit at him. There was a doctor where they put nails in his left hand. There was a doctor that put nails in his right hand. There was a doctor they put nails in his feet. There was a doctor that they hung him up on that cross one Friday. But there was a doctor that when you went to the tomb, you couldn't find him on Sunday morning because he had already got up with all power in his hand. Is there anybody here that knows the doctor? Somebody give him praise right now. Somebody give him praise right now. Hallelujah. I'm believing by faith that your recovery is connected to your repentance. Everybody stand on your feet right now. Hallelujah. We make this declaration in confidence. We make this declaration with the praise report in mind. You are delivered from the stuck place. Hallelujah.